I've been accused. Now you all are quiet. You're wondering what I've been accused of. <laughs> I've been accused of just taking one verse at a time and preaching on Romans so it stretches the study out for years. I've been accused of that because it's true. <laughs> I fess up. I'm guilty because I'm only going to do one verse today out of Romans chapter 9. Now, don't be giving me grief about this or I'll tell you about what I told my wife one time. She said, how come you take so long on this? I said, when you start living it, we'll move on. Yeah, but when you start living it, we'll move on. Not good. I woke up three days later in the hospital. The problem is that, not with you, it's more with me. Because I can't preach on something I don't live just doesn't work for me. If I can't live it out, I don't figure you'd be able to live it out either. If I don't understand it, I don't figure you'd be able to understand it. So if I can't do it, I'm not just going to skip over it. We're going to study it till we learn it. We're right here in Romans chapter 9, or 10 rather, in a section, right in the middle of a section of Romans, is very difficult to understand. It starts out in chapter 9 with a big question that nobody has yet fully understood, and that is, why is it that Israel as a nation, God's chosen people, miraculously protected and led and cared for by God for thousands of years, how come they missed the Messiah? How come they missed out? No one's really successfully answered that question. Paul has given us some insight into that answer, but even what he shared with us can be confusing. And so we have to kind of look at this passage that we're studying with the overview in mind. Now, first of all, the overview includes an application to all of us because, obviously, it was written to believers, Christians. And, obviously, Paul, through the leadership of the Spirit, thought that it was important enough for us to know something about it, for us to get something out of it. But what is it that he's trying to share with us? I don't think it's an it. I think there's a lot of stuff here, and that's why it takes us a while to get through this stuff. That's why I got I get stuck on a verse every now and then, you know. I'll read a verse, and all of a sudden, boom, something will jump out. The Spirit will say, there's something here I want you to know. Another confession I need to make to you today is I'm not preaching to you. I know you're sitting here listening and you're twiddling or playing grab-ass games with somebody. I understand that. But I'm not really preaching to you. I'm preaching to myself. If you all get anything out of it, that's between you and God. Okay? Because I'm preaching to myself. Your teacher is the Spirit. And every now and then I come across a verse, like this one I'm going to read to you in a moment, that the Spirit puts the brakes on and says, wait a minute, you're not even beginning to understand this. Hold up. Consider it for a little bit. And that's what happened to me at this verse. It's right at the end of what we've been studying concerning the mechanics of our salvation. You see, back in chapter 9, he introduces us to the idea that our salvation is up, is up to God entirely. 
has nothing to do with you. That may come as a shock to those of you that have been trying to save your butt your entire life. But the truth is, your salvation has nothing to do with you, according to Romans 9. He even used that illustration in the Old Testament. It just befuddles us. He said concerning the twins, Ishmael, or not Ishmael, but the twins born to Rebekah, he, Jacob and Esau, he said, before those boys were born, before they had any chance whatsoever to do anything, God said, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. Pretty strong language, isn't it? What? You mean it doesn't matter what you do? Not with God, according to Romans 9. Mm -mm. What counts with God is what we refer to as the election of grace. God's supernatural working in you to create you to be a brand new person that he has a work for you to do. Now that's the sovereignty of God. That's the sovereign side of God. But as I shared with you when we studied those verses, Anytime you see the sovereignty of God presented in the scriptures, you'll also find right next to it human responsibility. Every time. And so what follows here in chapter 9 is our responsibility as far as God is concerned. And it always comes back to one thing. Always, always, always. It comes back to whether or not you are going to believe, whether you're going to trust God or not. What he tells you. That's it. That's your responsibility. God's responsibility is the doing. Our responsibility is the believing. Now, I know religious folks like to switch that around, and they want God to trust us to do something. He doesn't. Right here in chapter 9, though, we're looking at our responsibility of faith, trusting God. Now, Paul has labeled that for us in these verses. He calls it the word of faith. And he says, don't freak out because the word of faith is close at hand. You don't have to go to heaven to get it. You don't have to go to hell to get it. The word of faith is right now in you. It's as close as your own tongue, your own mouth. The word of faith is in you right now. And then he explains that word of faith in those famous verses. That if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's your responsibility. Believe. And then he goes on to assure us in these verses that we've studied already. Give us some assurance here concerning that word of faith. He tells us, For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, Whosoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew or the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. And here's the verse that stopped me in my tracks. Kept me from moving on. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now I know if you're like me, you had somewhat of an infantile understanding of what that verse means. And I did too. I just kind of lumped it together with the context here and thought I had a handle on it. And the Holy Spirit said, wait. You don't have a clue. Stop and consider what I'm talking about here. 
for your application. What does it mean to call upon the name of the Lord? See, I thought it was confessing your mouth, Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart God has raised you from the dead, and you're saved. I thought those two were equivalent, but they're not. There's more to it than what I considered. And the promise here in this verse is astounding. That whole teaching about the election of God and the fact that he's responsible for our salvation, all that kind of stuff. He comes down to this promise. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That means, regardless of who you are, where you came from, what you've done, you can be saved. And that was encouraging, but it kind of fit with what I was talking about before until I remembered the definition of salvation. See, Paul's using a very generic term here. But if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Saved from what? You shall be saved. You've heard that, that term, I'm sure, used over the years. If you've had any kind of religious background, you've used it again and again. You've even asked it concerning yourself, am I saved? Or concerning others, they can't possibly be saved. <laughs> right? And we use that term as if we know what it really means. But we don't. We're just learning. It's a generic term that covers a lot of stuff. And that's what the Spirit started to show me about this. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Putting the problem of not understanding completely salvation aside for the moment, we'll come back to it in a minute, what does it mean to call upon the name of the Lord? And I've discovered a little truth in Bible study over the years that I've applied successfully in teaching and in my own life. And that is, any time the Bible uses the word name, like the name of Jesus, the name of the Lord, or the fact that you have a new name written down in the Lamb's Book of Life, Anytime the Bible uses that word name, what it's really talking about is who you are, your identity. So if we kind of alter this verse a little bit, what he's saying in effect is, whosoever shall call upon the identity of the Lord shall be saved. Now, I'm not wanting to make a confusing issue out of this for you. In fact, I'm wanting to do just the opposite. Because I was looking for an explanation of what does it mean? And the reason I was looking for this in the very first place is from my own experience and the experience I've seen with other people who are, quote, saved. By the way, have you ever noticed someone who is saved? They're a Christian, but they don't act like a Christian. Have you ever seen anybody like that? I mean, I'm talking about somebody besides yourself, right? <laughs> hmm? Here's the problem with we Christians. We don't always act like who we are, do we? In fact, we have a natural propensity to act like who we're not. We have all the conditioning of this world to not be who God says we are. And this problem causes 
shows itself, first of all, in the experience of those I call baby Christians, regardless of their chronological age, when they first call upon the name of the Lord, when they first believe in their heart that God has raised him from the dead, they first confess their need for Jesus, and they experience what Jesus called being born again. Now, that's a glorious event. That is a wonderful event. Because what they've really experienced for the first time in their life is a forgiveness of sin. The removal of guilt and penalty for their sin. And that's a freedom that the soul experiences intensely for some folks, more so than others. And they experience this wonderful experience of being born again. And something dramatic happens to them after that. That new Christian with all its zeal and all his wonderful experience of being forgiven runs into an old Christian who's considered that experience to be old hat. Now, if you like me, that happened to you, that first experience that happened to you a long time ago, nearly 50 years from me. I still remember it. But it doesn't produce the same emotion in me as it did 50 years ago. Still a fact, still true. I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart that God had raised him from the dead and I experienced being born again. That was a good thing. I was only 11 years old at the time. Now, do the math and you can figure out how old I am. But that was a long time ago, man. There's been a lot of stuff happened since then. It didn't take me long to lose all that joy and zeal and happiness that I was experiencing at that moment. The very next day it was gone. And replaced with a bunch of fear. Now, that salvation experience that we had, that initial experience, is not all he's talking about here. And that's the point I want to get to you. That's why he repeats the mechanics here again in verse 13 when he says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's as applicable to you and I today, as relevant to our lives today as it was for me 50 years ago when I accepted Jesus. This is just as relevant. And that's what I hadn't seen before. Because when I read these verses, I thought, yeah, I already did that. Now what? And that's when the Spirit put the brakes on and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You don't know. You don't know what the importance is I'm talking about here. So here's the punchline. We don't just get saved one time. Even though that one-time experience initially is a wonderful experience, that's not all God has in mind for you. He's got a lot more salvation than you know about already planned for you. And it's not just a one-shot deal that happened a long time ago. It's available to you for you today. That same kind of salvation. Now, I'll help you clarify what we're talking about. I'm going to do a little definition on salvation again. What you were saved from, what I was saved from oh, nearly 50 years ago, was the guilt and penalty of my sin. Being born selfish. Being conditioned by this world to want what I want when I wanted it and to get, by any means available to me, what I want. 
without regards to anybody else, especially God. I was saved from the guilt and penalty of that natural condition when I first confessed the Lord Jesus and believed in my heart. What you've been saved from, if you've confessed your need for the Lord Jesus and believed in your heart that God raised him from the dead, is the guilt and penalty of your sin. And that's a good thing. It's wonderful. That's a relief, by the way. <laughs> you go, whew, that's good. But that's not all you need to be saved from. You know that? Oh, yeah, I know. You can stop right there and say, I got my ticket to heaven. When I die, I'm going to heaven. But the problem is, you ain't dead yet. <laughs> now what are you going to do? No, no, there's a lot more to be saved from. And that's really what the Bible's all about. That's really what Romans and the gospel is all about, is the more to be saved from. That's what we've been studying the whole book of Romans. You see, there's also the need that each one of us experience on a daily basis, the need to be saved from the habit, the power, the dominion of sin in our lives. See, when you were born again, do you ever notice how you didn't change automatically? Hmm? You get born again and you run into the bathroom, look into the mirror, and who do you see? The same old person you've always been, right? There was no outward change. All there was was an inward change. That change centers around and is wholly concerned with your identity, who you are. Who you are radically and completely changed the moment you believe on Jesus. You became a totally different person the moment you believed. Now here's where we need salvation from the habit and dominion of sin because the habit and dominion of sin in your life says, no, 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 I'm the same old person I've always been. Nothing has happened to me. Nothing has changed. I'm the same old person. Look, I look the same, I talk the same, I act the same. I'm the same old person I've always been all my life. No, you're not. That's the lie. And in that unbelief concerning that lie is the sin you need to be saved from. You see, the sin that does so easily beset all of us is the sin of unbelief. Far, far more to your salvation than just you get to go to heaven when you die. Far more. Your salvation to be experienced with authentic faith is a daily experience. Now, Paul's introduced us to that on what we need to believe. And here he just summarizes it as calling upon the name, the identity of the Lord. Let me rephrase that for you. To call on the identity or the name of the Lord is to believe who the Lord says he made you to be. To actually believe what God says is true about you is to call upon the name of the Lord with regards to your identity. Let's see how unbelievable that really is. You stop and think about it. Man, that's a big one, isn't it? What does God actually say about you? Well, we've studied probably almost half a year ago now, I guess. Romans 6, 7, and 8. 
And by now you've forgotten it. Romans 6, 7, and 8 is a clear explanation, detailed explanation by Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit describing the new person you are. You see that detailed explanation? Is a description of your new identity. Who God said he made you to be. Now just look at how unbelievable that thing is. Go back to Romans 6 again. Do you believe you died or do you believe you've always been alive? Hmm? Ever since I was born, I've always been alive. I never have died. Came close to dying a bunch of times. People trying to kill me, but I never died. Here I am. I'm still alive. Lie. When Jesus was crucified on the cross, according to the Word of God, when he was crucified on the cross, you were crucified with him on the cross. Now, you can't get deader than that. Crucified. God said you were. I know it doesn't feel like it, doesn't seem like it. That's why it's so hard for us to believe. But God said you were crucified with him. Not only crucified, you were buried with him. But he didn't leave you in the grave. When Jesus rose again from the dead, you were made alive together with him, and you rose together with Christ, a brand new person. You're no longer the same person you've always been. Is that what we believe? I shared a moment ago with you that I first believed and was saved when I was 11 years old. It wasn't until I was 33 years old had actually been pastoring a church for about six or seven years, been through Bible college, that I ever once understood I'm not the same person I've always been. You know, you can be a Christian and dumb as a box of rocks. Did you know that? Yeah, you can. You're kind of like a baby when you're born again. You go up, ask that little newborn baby in the crib there in, in the nursery in the hospital, what's your name? Who are you? They don't know. Who's your daddy? They don't know. Where do you live? What are you going to do? They're dumb as a box of rocks. That's why God makes them cute. <laughs> they're not only dumb, but they're also self-centered and selfish, and we'd kill them before they were five if they weren't cute. See, that's baby Christians to a T. Dumb as a box of rocks. They don't know who their Heavenly Father is, much less how to hear His voice, tell them what He wants them to do. And it all starts right there with whether you believe who you are or not. Do you believe who you are? Are you still thinking you're the same old person you've always been your whole life? God says you're not. God said what He did on the cross of Calvary with the person and work of His Son, Jesus Christ, made you a brand new person. Do you know anything about that new person you are? Most people don't. They haven't got a clue. They don't know they have the mind of Christ. They don't know they have the spirit of Christ living inside of them. They don't know. Now we're going to talk about this next week, Lord willing. But the reason they don't know primarily is because nobody's bothered to tell them. Well, what have they told them then? Well, now that you're a Christian, you need to go to church. Now that you're a Christian, you need to start reading your Bible. You ain't going to understand a thing about it, but you need to do it. Now that you're a Christian, you need to start tithing. That's a big one. You know what that means, don't you? 
Yeah, 10%. Man, the government takes 7%. 10%. Now that you're a Christian, you need to stop doing all these other things they consider to be non-Christian. That's what they teach. Instead of, now that you're a Christian, this is who you are. You're dead indeed in a sin and alive unto God. Now that you're a Christian, you're a brand new person given the power of the Spirit to walk in newness of life. Now that you're a Christian, you're dead to the law, married to Christ, so that you can be led by His Spirit to live like Christ. Now that you're a Christian, your number one thing is to love other people like Christ. See, they don't teach you that stuff normal religious circles mm -mm. they don't teach you who you are but that's foundational that's fundamental to the gospel because until you learn who you are you will never know what you need to do ever I've talked to people over the last 40 years who were asking me what do you think I ought to do what do you think I ought to do I don't know what you ought to do I'm trying to figure out what I ought to do it's not about what you're going to do. It's about what you're going to believe about yourself, who God said he made you to be. Now, you might think, and I don't have time to review it all with you today, but you might think that Romans 6, 7, and 8 is kind of irrelevant to my daily life, you know? The fact that I was dead, crucified with Christ, buried with him, raised up the third day to walk in newness of life, et cetera, et cetera. All that stuff is, you know, it's kind of irrelevant to what I'm going to do when I get off work. No, it's not irrelevant. It has everything to do with your life. It's not irrelevant at all. Because it all describes who you are, who God has made you to be, the name, the identity of the Lord. See, if you realize that you are Christ. Did you know that? Oh, man, you just blasphemed, didn't you? <laughs> I just blasphemed, didn't I? Just to tell you you are Christ. That's what our religious mind thinks. So you are Christ in the way this little finger of mine is John Glenn. You see this little finger? That's John Glenn. You mess with this little finger, you're going to be messing with John Glenn. This is John Glenn. Now, it's not all of John Glenn. It's John Glenn's little finger. But in the same exact way, you are Christ. You're a member of the body of Christ. That's your new identity. No, you're not all of Christ. No, you're not the Christ. But you are Christ. God has given you that brand new identity. Do you know anything about that? Do you know anything about what that identity means to your daily life? What that identity means to how you relate to other people? How you conduct your affairs at home? How you do your job at work? See, it has everything to do with your life. Right now, on this earth. Your identity, in a nutshell, gives you hope gives you hope more than anything else. See, if you know who you are, you have hope, a joyful, confident expectation about your future. If I look at the news, I have depression. I get depressed every time I look at the news. I burst into anger and want to destroy the TV set so I don't look at the news. Instead, I look at who I am, who God said he made me to be, and I'm not a bit worried about what's going on in this world. Not a bit worried about what's going to happen, because I am Christ. You understand that confidence? That's a confident expectation about your future. That's what comes out of your identity. And from that hope, comes your ability to love other people sacrificially, intelligently, 
love them just like Christ. Now, your identity is relevant to every aspect of your life. You may not think it is. You might think it's just some kind of little religious academic exercise. No, 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 no. Your life depends on your identity. And so the good news, whoever shall call upon the identity of the Lord shall be saved. That's a daily promise, folks. That's not a one-shot deal. That's a daily promise. See, I've got to call on the name of the Lord today. I got to call on him this afternoon. I got to call on him tomorrow. I got to call on him the next day. Learning to live your new identity out is the most important and healthy lifestyle you'll ever develop. This is why Paul told the Colossians, he said, in the same way that you receive Christ Jesus your Lord, how's that? By grace, through faith, confessing with his mouth the Lord Jesus, believing in your heart, God raised him from the dead, and you're a brand new person, so walk ye in him. Live your life daily based on who God said he made you to be. It'll radically change you. Radically change your life. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's guaranteed. It's not up for grabs. It's guaranteed. Straight from God himself. Let's close in prayer. Father God, as we come into your presence, I thank you and I praise you for what you've done for us that we couldn't do for ourselves, for the new persons you've made us to be. And Father, even though we don't understand that truth, we know it's a seed seed of truth that we've received and we ask you to cause it to bear fruit in us to bring that fruit forth in our daily lives in our experience and even though we very barely understand the concept of we're no longer the same person we ask you to make it real to us through your spirit as you promised would guide us in all truth your spirit who would lead us remind us teach us We ask, Father, that you would raise us up. We thank you for this milk of the word. And we ask you, Father, to let it do its job in us. For these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Appreciate you all being here. Have a good week. Go in peace.